Welcome everybody on behalf of PLWA. Uh, my name is Tamara Lampard. I'm a library officer at South Perth Libraries. And today it is my pleasure to be hosting this event for PLWA without whom we would not be able to present today Holden and Shanae. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that the land that we are all gathered on um, is Wajak Noongar land. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to their ancestors. I'd also like to acknowledge the ongoing contribution that the Noongar people make to the life of our city and our regions and Indigenous people make to the lands across the whole of our country. I welcome everybody wherever you are um, on your on land and pay my respects to the elders of the land that you are on if you are not on Wajak Noongar land. It is now my pleasure to introduce Shanae Maripodi, and she's an author, a journalist, and the, uh, the host of the Writers Off the Page podcast. She's worked for almost a decade in the media industry, reporting for Channel 7's Today Tonight and for online news and radio before jumping the fence to become a media advisor. Her debut middle grade novel, One Wrong Turn, will be out next year through Fremantle Press. So I'm going to hand over to Shanae and Holden. Please enjoy their conversation um, and remember to put your any questions that you have into the chat. Thanks so much, both thank Holden you. and Shanae, and welcome. Thank you so much for that, Tamara, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's exciting to be online and have you all here with us today for this event through Public Libraries WA with Holden Shepherd. Of course, I am joined by the incredibly talented, multi-award winning Western Australian author Holden Shepherd. Holden, how are you going? G'day, Shanae. I'm really great. Nice to be here chatting with you and g'day to everyone who's uh, tuned in. Thank you heaps. Now, I'm sure if you've joined us today, I don't need to give Holden too much of an introduction, but I will anyway, because it makes him feel incredibly uncomfortable, me talking about him and pumping up his horn while he's sitting there. So <laughs> Holden burst onto the literary scene in 2019 with his debut novel, Invisible Boys. It was published to both critical and commercial success, won the WA's Premier Prize for an Emerging Writer, was shortlisted for the Victorian Premier Premier's Literary Awards and was named a notable book by the Children's Book Council of Australia. To top everything off, it's now being developed into a TV series, which we'll find out a little bit more about later. But of course, we're here to talk about Holden's latest book, the very powerful novel called The Brink, which is out now with text publishing. There it is on Holden's screen in its full glory. Holden, it's been out now for what we're about a month and a half now. You've been traveling everywhere promoting it how's everything been going uh Shanae, it's been awesome uh i have spent about three years talking about my first book only so um you can imagine how excited it's uh, exciting it's been for me to have something new to talk about uh so yeah it's been pretty amazing to see the reaction of of readers uh to the brink that people are actually loving this story um finding it you know fast paced and a page turner and all that kind of stuff which is everything i could have hoped for and more and it's doing so well already. We heard that it was named Dimmick's YA Book of the Month nationally, which is huge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm really stoked about Dimmick's doing that. Um, it, it was just kind of a cool full circle moment. So like the very first, you know, not the first bookshop I ever went into, that's not accurate. But um, when I was seven, when I was a little kid, we used to come to Perth from Geraldton on these road trips and uh, we would go to Dimmick's in the Galleria, Dimmick's Morley. And that was the bookshop we used to go to. And I'd get Emily Rodder and Enid Blyton books and all this kind of, you know, junior fiction, middle grade kind of stuff. Um, and that's where I was like, I'm going to be a writer one day. Like th that was the moment, that was the trip um, that I decided that. And so to have, you know, have it specifically be Dimmick's who have named the Brink their YA book of the month across the whole country. It's like, oh, like, that book, my book is in their shop and it's in all of their shops. Um, you know, it's a pretty cool feeling. I'm still, I'm still a bit kind of starstruck by the whole thing. Yeah. I can imagine. It's absolutely massive. Congratulations. Now, if people haven't read the novel yet, I'll get you to give everyone a bit of a rundown about what The Brink is about. Yeah, so The Brink is a coming of age novel slash thriller. 
Uh, it's about a group of school leavers who are on their uh, leavers trip after the end of year 12 and they head up north from Perth uh, to Durian Bay, excited, pumped, ready to have a whole week of partying and surfing and swimming and all the fun stuff that goes with leavers. Uh, but then in the middle of their leavers trip, uh, somebody drops dead. And that sudden death has massive consequences for the whole group, but especially for the three misfits of the group, um, which are the three characters that we see the whole story unfold through the eyes of. So uh, we have Leonardo, who's shy and anxious. Uh, we have Kaya, who's the good girl. Um, and we have Mason, who's uh, the footy player, the jock. And through their eyes, we see how this leavers trip and the death force them to confront not just who they are, but also where they fit in the group and where they fit in the whole world. I'm almost too scared to ask what your leavers experience was like based on this. So instead, I'll ask you, what sparked the idea of the brink? <laughs> <laughs> there were no, I, there were no blastings or stabbings at my. No dead leavers. bodies on your leavers. No, trip. <laughs> well, not, not to my knowledge. I mean, you know, I don't know what everyone else got up to. Um, actually, do you know, our leavers trip is partially the cause of this story um, because we went to Durian Bay when I was on leavers and not me, not my group, but some people I know from my high school uh, did cause some damage uh, while they were there. And it caused the town to say, we're not taking leavers in future, um, which I think is fair enough. Um, but it just gave me the idea for the very start of this book when, you know, we have a whole group of leavers heading up to party in this town and then they get turned around. Um, you know, that's what, you know, that's what they're, fa they're faced with this idea of, okay, we're ready for leavers. It's not going to be what we thought it was going to be. So what's our backup plan? And that's what leads them to, instead of being in a town, um, being on a remote island, you know, a beautiful beach, beautiful spot, um, but very, very remote. And I think I was just particularly inspired. Uh, you know, I know that coast very well. I've been driving up and down it ever since the Indian Ocean Drive opened up in probably whatever it was, 2009, I think. That road opened up between Geraldton and Perth. So all my road trips have been back and forth up there um, and I've just been very you know a lot of hours staring at the road my husband usually is sleeping next to me um, sometimes he'll chat to me but usually he's sleeping so it leaves me a lot of time to think and uh, I was very inspired by all those little towns or little shack communities in these really remote places and uh, one particular time my old Commodore broke down in between uh, Cervantes and Lancelot uh, pretty much where I imagine the fictional Brink Island would, would physically be located. And uh, you can't get help there. There is just nothing. You know, there's no phone signal. There's not a lot of cars going down that road. Um, and I thought, wow, what a great place to set a little bit of a murder mystery. So the Brink Island itself, completely fictional, just inspired by towns? Yeah, yeah. I, I pretty consciously didn't want to name a place and say this is you know this is where it's set um especially knowing that a lot of those coastal kind of shack communities have faced a lot of um you know governments trying to shut them down and things like that um so i was just like i don't want to kind of i don't want to set a book in one of those places and then you know suggest that those places are full of murderers um that's probably not a great thing to do to a, you know, a real place um and i feel like i've already got away with you know, Invisible Boys are called Geraldton, you know, poxy shithole of a town in the very first line. Um, there's only so much damage I can do to, you know, tourism WA. Um, so uh, I deliberately just made this completely fictional. You know, if, if you know that part of the world, if you know that part of the WA coast, you'll have an idea of the kind of places it could be based on. Um, but deliberately, it's completely made up. Now, as writers, we often hear people talk about second book syndrome, imposter syndrome, the fear of when you've had enormous success like you did with Invisible Boys that there can be a bit of nerves surrounding your second book was that the case for you? Um, to put it mildly should I? <laughs> <laughs> bit of nerves um, yeah I mean existential crisis more like it you know um, it was absolutely terrifying it was absolutely terrifying to have I mean very exciting like I've you know very very happy I would not trade um, a success of Invisible Boys for anything. Um, I was very happy with how it was received, but certainly when you have a book that hits all those metrics really nicely, you know, it had great sales, it had 
awards, it had acclaim. Readers kind of particularly liked it. You know, that was a that's probably my favorite metric, um, apart from sales, because that means I get paid. But <laughs> um, no, but like that is the meaningful part. You know, the most meaningful part of having a book out is that readers respond and you get messages from people all the time. Um, and with Invisible Boys being such a, a book that was close to home for me, but also tapped into something that I don't think had been said in this country before. Um, I've, you know, I still get messages more or less every day and that book's been out for three years. That's so amazing. That's a, hundreds of messages from people who feel seen by it, who grew up gay in the country and, and really vibed with it. Um, and so maybe, you know, you have all these things that have happened with the first book and the expectation's kind of like, well, now do it all again, but better and 10 times bigger. Um, and that pressure is huge. Like I found it absolutely terrifying. Uh, and all I could do was kind of throw it away. Um, the only way I could make myself write something new was to go, I'm tuning all of this out because if I try to write something 10 times bigger, 10 times better, um, I'm going to get very lost and I'm not going to be an artist anymore. I'm going to be something else, someone pretending to be an artist um, for the sake of success. And that's not how good books are written. So I had to just tune it all out and go back to the same process I had with Invisible Boys, which was you know, Hemingway inspired, write hard and clear about what hurts. And uh, that's what I did. I wrote about what hurt, and, you know, with the brink, it was my identity and reinventing myself after high school and all the stuff I went through with my friends and family um, when I was younger. And I thought, well, here we go. Time to write about that and put it all on the page, follow the same process. And, you know, it's actually quite freeing to accept that you have no control over anything else. You know, like I, I can't control uh the reception of a book, I can only control the production of it, um, which is liberating. I can't remember where I saw it or heard it, but I I heard you say that you were using the brink to prove that you could write a book, which when I, I heard it, I was like, that's so strange. Like we already know that you're more than capable of writing a book given Invisible Boys and how incredible it was. So what's your take on that? What did you I mean? Did, it, that is correct. I did say those words. Um, I... What I meant was, I think, I think probably because I've seen a lot of them, that there's a whole bunch of people who write a, a first book inspired by their own life trauma. And, you know, maybe in the gay male space, especially, there's a lot of us who kind of, you know, we'll have our book that's about what we went through. Um, but what I noticed during the promo cycle for the, uh, for Invisible Boys and then for the years that followed was that it, my own personal story was so entwined in the promotion of that book you know I, I found myself constantly saying you know here's what happened to me in Geraldton and here's how it felt to grow up you know as a gay man in that town and I started to think like okay I'm 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 selling my own trauma I'm selling my own story here and what I wanted to do was just be like hey I can write a book that is not necessarily about my life story um and 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 prove that I can write a coming-of-age novel prove that I can write a thriller and that that book can stand alone as a piece of art without me having to delve deep into, you know, trauma and vulnerability all the time necessarily. Um, so that's that's what I kind of meant by that. Well, you definitely can write a book, a very, very good one at that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I said to you when I was, what was it, three quarters of the way through, I messaged you and I was like, oh, Holden, I haven't taken a breath for a really long time because I hold my breath when... I'm really into a story or I'm terrified and I think I was a little bit nervous at the time with what was going on in the book but the second thing I said to you was I feel like I know your characters I feel like I've met each and every one of them back when I was at school or today even because you write characters that are so real and not just your main characters your supporting characters characters that have a very brief cameo they all they all leap off the page and into your mind because of how you create them. How do you do it? <laughs> do you character <laughs> map or what's the secret? Oh, God, I don't know. I mean, I definitely don't kind of um, base people off people I know directly. That's, um, <laughs> that's always been terrifying to me. Um, you don't just change just, a name here and there? No, I'm terrified <laughs> of doing that. I'm just, you know, I'm worried that if I ever do go down that path, I would just end up writing something that's so transparent that, you know, someone would just be like, that's defamation, I'm suing you. Um, <laughs> so so the characters are always like really deliberately made up people. Um, but the kind of what, and what it tends to be is that the emotional truth of what they're going through, as especially the point of view characters, um, are very much me. So people, so in this book, you know, Leonardo, Kaya, Mason, their characters are drawn from my own 
myself heavily and then I've kind of put in some fictional flourishes, I guess, to make them not me. Um, and, but then, yeah, you're right. You know, there's a bigger cast at play here and I guess um, I don't know the answer to how I flesh those characters out well. Um, the thing I always come back to is that I spent a lot of time as a kid listening and reading. Um, so I, I was, you know, in a big family, there's eight of us, so six kids and two parents and then lots of cousins and lots of noise. And, you know, we were just a noisy, big family. Um, and all my siblings were much older than me. So I remember sitting and just listening to a lot of conversations at the, at, at the table when we'd have tea each night. And, you know, I wasn't part of the conversation because I was like seven and everyone else was kind of, you know, between 14 and adulthood. So it was kind of this adult conversations always going on. And I guess I just observed how teenagers talk and how adults talk. And um, I learned uh, how to like the subtleties of those things, you know, like especially at a dinner table, I think, and probably at an Italian dinner table, you know, specifically, <laughs> um, there was just such, you know, like a whole war could break out over, you know, the spaghetti course. And, you know, like, and it could be so subtle and it could be expressed through these tiny little things. Um, but, you know, it could mean these two people hate each other. And I just thought like that, those kind of nuances are fascinating. And I think I picked up on a lot of that being the little kid at those tables so many times. Do you map out your characters before you start writing or do you get to know them as the book progresses? Um, I used to do a lot of mapping out characters prior to writing any words and I don't do that so much anymore. Um, mostly, like, it's, it can be really fun. Like, for my first, uh, the first novel I ever wrote was a fantasy novel and I had full character profiles for all the, the main characters and it was, you know, pages and pages. It was actually really fun to do. Um, but it would be like, you know, like what's their family tree and where do they come from and what are their ambitions in life? What are their fears? You know, it was fun. Um, but I didn't kind of learn who they were. Like I, mm -hmm. I did those profiles, but I'd never heard them speak and I'd never understood who these characters were. It was a little bit, there was something bloodless about that process that didn't quite hit for me, even though I enjoyed it. And what I've learned with Invisible Boys and everything I write since is that I'm better off just having a very, very rough sketch of, you know, a few words, maybe a paragraph of notes of like, here's this really rough thing about this character, not even necessarily what they look like, but just a vibe of um, their attitude and maybe what they're all about. And then that's enough. And then I just start writing them in a scene. And in that scene, the character will tell me who they are. Um, and I prefer that approach. It's just, it's a little bit more lively. Do characters ever surprise you? I hear authors say that sometimes that they're writing a scene and then a character does something that they completely didn't expect. And I didn't understand it until I was writing myself and went, oh yeah, yeah, it happens. They take on a mind of their own. Oh, hundred um, percent. I mean, Invisible Boys is like the whole book is an example of that because it was meant to be a short story. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was meant to be, you know, my plan was to write this book about uh, a version of the character Hammer when he is an adult. And I was like, okay, I'll just like, you know, dip my toe in the water of writing this character. And I'll write a little short story about him at 16 when he first realized he was gay and he goes to a family wedding and, um, you know, hooks up with a waiter who was a version of Zeke, um, but an older version of Zeke. Um, so I just started writing this little, you know, short story. Um, and it just kept spiraling out of control until it was, you know, hundred thousand words and it was a book. You know, it was, these characters had so much they wanted to say. I had so much I wanted to say, but the characters just had stuff they had to do. You know, I couldn't just leave them hanging at the wedding. I needed to find out what happened before the wedding and, you know, what happened after the wedding. Um, so, yeah, it happens a lot. Now, the beauty of your writing, I think what really gets me in is that there's this rawness to it. And it's very much, I feel like you as a person, you're very much what you see is what you get. You know exactly where you stand with you. And I love that about you. And I love it about your writing that there's no, there's no glitter. There's no, no frills. It's just everything is there on the page in its raw beauty. And you don't shy away from subjects that are a little bit difficult to handle. In the brink, you tackle masculinity in a bit of a different way to what you did in Invisible Boys. I'll get you to tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, masculinity, sexuality, all these things, identity, mental health, they're all, always things that kind of keep coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember, uh, look, I don't remember who it was, but I know an author or someone has kind of indicated to me before, 
that authors tend to have like, you know, one or two big things. And we just kind of keep coming back to them in different ways, you know, peeling the onion um, every time we write a book and it's just another layer of this same onion, um, which I think is fascinating. I think it's probably true. Like I suspect I'll be working with these themes for a lot of the books that I write forever and it'll just be in different ways, hopefully fresh ways that aren't, you know, entirely boring. Um, so with Invisible Boys, I, I wrote, you know, it was about being a man and uh, probably the characters of Hammer and maybe Matt to some extent were, were grappling with that sense. Um, but what I noticed kind of for the three years after that book came out um, was this maybe misunderstanding of what I was trying to do with Hammer in terms of, because I was trying to set up, you know, like here's this guy who is, a, a, you know, going to be kind of a blokey footy player kind of dude. He's also attracted to men. And I was trying to kind of get across that that exists. Um, and probably because of what I did with Hammer's character in that story, um, people kind of got the sense of like, okay, so he's in the closet, but if he could just come out, then he'd be fixed and he'd be gay and he, you know, wouldn't be pretending to be masculine. He'd be normal and gay and, uh, you know, dancing to Lady Gaga at the court or, you know, whatever they do. Um, whatever, the, whatever the gays are listening to these days, um, which is obviously completely fine. Um, but I was like, no, that's not like, that's an existing stereotype. That's fine. There's lots of representation out there for that. Um, but I was trying to do something different. Um, so with this book specifically, I tried to set up uh, the character of Mason uh, to kind of go more specifically into the space of masculinity and to kind of just establish the existence of characters like this. Cause they're guys who I've met growing up. They're guys who I know, um, Mason's a little bit of me you know he's better looking and he's better at footy um, so it's kind of wish fulfillment but um, he's a version of me grappling with that sense of you know in a way the book is kind of uh, tearing apart that kind of stoic violence dominance aspect of traditional masculinity and kind of ripping those kind of negative connotations out and going well what are the good parts you know if you if you strip that stuff down what's left that we actually like in these characters. And, and for Mason, it's things like camaraderie and, and larrikinism and that kind of stuff. Um, so I want to explore the existence of that kind of character who's also same-sex attractive. It's funny, I found that Mason ended up being unexpectedly my favourite character of the whole book. And I remember that, I remember hearing you say that in Invisible Boys, there were quite a few people that didn't like Hammer, which I don't remember being against Hammer myself. I, he was a character and he had a role to play in the story. But Mason I really, really loved. And it's funny you talking about the stereotypes and those sorts of things because when I picked up The Brink, I knew that you had a gay character in the novel. And in the first chapter I was like, oh, it's Leonardo because he's gentle, he's soft, he's got his anxieties and I love that you flipped it I love that you caught me off guard and just showed that no you know what life's not that black and white it's we don't fall into these stereotypes yeah yeah I'm so glad that that happened for you I'm so I'm really happy because that's um I felt I really guilty to be to honest <laughs> And so you should. No, no, no. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think people should feel guilty at all for those stereotypes because I think they exist. And I think they're, you know, sometimes stereotypes are true and that's okay. Like, you know, sometimes they are. They do map across to some of us, you know. Sometimes um, if you want to go dance to the court, the, the court, that's fine. Yeah, and I think that's what, and that's what I tried to do with the character of Brayden in this book especially. You know, he is um, the counterpart to Mason in that he's, you know, a, a more... Um, flamboyant, you know, feminine camp kind of gay guy. And he's totally fine with that. And I think I wanted to make the point, especially that, you know, that's absolutely fine. Um, and that's a version of gay guys that exists and, you know, is there's no value judgment associated with that. And I was just trying to say, and here's also Mason. And, and these two guys are both same sex contracted and they're both really different. Um, so yeah, I am, I am glad that Mason surprised you in that way. Um, and, and if it shakes up a few people's perceptions, I think it works both ways as well. I think it, someone like Leonardo being a really terrified young man um, reflects a lot of guys I know who have anxiety, who have panic disorder, who uh, have been abused or have faced a whole heap of stuff um, that, that really has broken them or has hurt them or has hurt their confidence, right? Um, they're probably not classic, rough, tough, dominant guys. And so kind of projecting that version of masculinity onto them inherently is probably not right. So I hope that Mason breaks the stereotype, but also hope that Leonardo can as well in a way. The other thing you really get into with this, which I guess it comes hand in hand, to be honest with you, is identity and not just how we perceive ourselves, but how 
others perceive us, particularly at that point in high school where a lot of the characters say, you know, we're moving on from high school, we don't know who we are and we've created this persona for high school, now what? I love some of the lines that you have included in this book and one of my favourites, you talk about Pluto and whether Pluto is a planet or not and the iconic line from Mason, and excuse me if I, I don't say it in its proper form, is F their rules, Pluto. If you want to be a planet, you are. And that is brilliant. It says so much about identity, doesn't it? Uh, I, <laughs> I love that you <laughs> like that line. Um, yeah, uh, that was really important to me. And it was kind of grappling that sense of, um, especially probably when a lot of us go through high school and there's a, or it, you know, probably not even high school only. I mean, work as well. I think a lot of us have to put on a persona for work or for family or for anything. Um, but for me, you know, specifically high school and growing up, there's a certain persona you put up and then, you know, and that's, you know, the version of you that the world sees kind of becomes the version of you that you think is okay. And uh, I think what I want to do with the, with the, you know, Pluto as a real planet thing um, was to just kind of twist that conversation back the way I feel, you know, in therapy, it probably usually goes, which is, you know, how other people define you is really none of your business. Um, what's most important is how you're defining yourself. And uh, certainly with a character like Mason, and I guess circling a little bit back to the masculinity thing, um, in Invisible Boys, it was kind of mentioned that, you know, you're only masculine if other men kind of say you are, you know, like, the, you know, the way to achieve that is that you've got to get this kind of acceptance from the group, from fraternity. Um, and Mason's point with saying, well, Pluto's a planet anyway, you know, even if you kick me out as a planet, even if you say I'm, I'm no longer meeting the criteria uh, of being a real planet, um, you know what, you know, screw the rules, uh, I'm going to be a planet anyway. There's huge power in self-definition and, and just kind of owning your own identity. And I think that's what I wanted to get across, especially for teens, um, maybe especially LGBT teens, um, but really anyone. I mean, adults can relate to that, you know, that sense of, okay, I'm going to own who I am and, and you know, forget anyone who, who doesn't agree with me because it's my life, it's my identity. Is that something, I mean, I talk about how you're very much of what you see is what you get type of person. Has it always been that way? Is this something, you know, your your Pluto theory, is it something you've always lived by or is that something that you've just matured and, and learnt over time? My my um, my Pluto wisdom was hard <laughs> one. It was very hard one. It was, um, and you know, I was not like that. I was probably most like Leonardo or in high school in terms of, how I was you know I was I was quite terrified I, I definitely performed a persona for for everyone else um in order to gain acceptance in order to be seen as okay um but but to a really kind of toxic point where it was kind of like there was no me <laughs> there was there was no what do I want to do or who do I want to be it was just like okay keep you know in any given social circle family circle workplace whatever okay, like, who am I, who do I need to please, who do I need approval from, okay, what do I need to do to get that, and there was no sense of, like, starting out from a place of, like, wait, who am I, what do I like, what do I value, like, that, that should probably come first, um, that was very hard one after, you know, a whole heap of rejection and a whole heap of growing up in my 20s, I guess, um, but I would have loved to know it when I was 18, I just think that would have been you know, if we, could, if we could teach things like expressing yourself or asserting yourself or setting boundaries um, at high school, you know, I'd love that for, for that to be a, you know, probably not a whole subject. It's probably not as uh, probably not as vital as English or maths, but, you know, chuck it in there as a little two-week module somewhere. I think it would be really useful. Yeah. Just a reminder to people, I'll be opening up to questions in about 10 or so me minutes. So if you want to start popping them in the chat, if there's something that you're burning to know, if you want to ask Holden, pop it in and we'll be getting to them soon. So oh, Holden, from, hmm? are you going to say something? I was just saying, please, yeah, and please tell us where you're from as well. Like in yeah, some, love I, to I know, know there's some is. libraries. I know there's some people from different parts of Perth and WA and I know there's whole groups, I think, at some of the libraries. So, um, yeah, definitely let us know where you're, where you're from um, when you're asking your question. It'd be great to hear from you. Now, I talked about at the start how, you know, you burst onto the literary scene or that's what it felt like from the outside looking in that, you know, you write these novels that are just enormous successes. And meanwhile, you're managing to juggle playing footy, juggling a job, 
juggling gym selfies that everybody knows about. <laughs> now, the novels just don't come out of it, out of nowhere. There's a lot of work that goes into them. Is that right? Of course, yeah. Um, it's so funny. You're not the only one who has asked me that in an interview of kind of like, hey, it just came out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just burst onto the scene and you were suddenly, you know, appeared fully formed at the age of 30 and, <laughs> and off you went. Um, no, it was a really long process, you know, what I mentioned at the start about going to Dimmicks, being seven years old and going, you know, and, and it's like, it sounds like a little fun thing, but also um, I really meant it. I was serious at seven, you know, like I was like, this is my career. This is what I want to do with my life. It's my dream. I'm doing it. I'm going to be a writer. So to be that serious at that age and to be really kind of doggedly pursuing that career from the age of seven and, you know, Invisible Boys got published when I was 31. So you know, that's whatever it is. I can't do math very well. That's like 24 years of um, just working away kind of in silence in the shadows. No one knew who I was. No one cared. You know, like um, it's tough and tons of rejection, you know, like so much rejection. Um, the thing no one tells you is the rejection keeps going even after you're published. Like I, I didn't expect that. I think I thought once I had one book out, it would be like done and, you know, everything just falls in your lap after that. Um, but it's really, it's not the case. The rejection continues um, even after that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry to break the news, Shanae. Um, <laughs> but, you know, after your first book is out, it's still hard. Um, that, but that actually was the thing. Like I, um, I had, uh, my brother said it to me once, he's like, and this is years before I had a book out. It was something had gone well for me in terms of something. Um, and he's like, oh, everything just falls in your lap, doesn't it? And I just remember like, <laughs> <laughs> just want to have that moment where I like like shouted at him <laughs> and I was like no <laughs> like I'm here just at my desk you know instead of hanging out with mates instead of doing anything fun on the weekend instead of socializing instead of any number of hobbies I'm at my desk you know and that's what I'm doing and late at night instead of I don't know playing a video game I'm doing emails and you know it's 5am I'm doing 5am writers club to get my book done before I go to work like it was just so much hard work and um yeah none of it gets seen which is which is pretty much fine um and I don't tend to mind that up until someone says things just fall into your lap don't they it's such an <laughs> offensive phrase I think people mean it as a genuine compliment of course yeah. but it yeah. is that oh man just acknowledge the work that that goes into doing that um yeah is it right that the brink it wasn't actually the second book you wrote. It was one of the earlier books you wrote. Yeah, yeah. I started The Brink. It's, it's pretty much the first thing I wrote after I finished my honours thesis after uni. Um, and I kind of was like, okay, time to write a, a book that's really going to get out there and get published. And the first thing I started was a version of this. Um, it was not good, though. So, I, you know, I can say that pretty comfortably. I looked at it about two days ago because I've I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times in interviews this past couple of months. I was like, I wonder if it was any good. And I looked it up and it's really bad. Like, it's just so terrible um, that I'm glad no one has ever seen it. It will never see the light of day. Um, uh, you know, because I was looking at it thinking, maybe I'll post a little page of this on my blog. But no, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it was bad. And it was bad writing. But I think that's the way you learn. And the most daunting thing about starting out as a novelist was starting you know like mm -hmm. like getting some words down realizing they're bad um realizing the whole project might not work and starting it again or reimagining that whole project so um for me yeah this is you know there's a version of this with a bus exploding at the start um which was not good but then i kind of revisited and revisited you know wrote a fantasy book came back to it changed it wrote invisible boys came back to it changed it um so there were a lot of um a lot of iterations of The Brink over the last eight years, eight and a half years before it got published. Um, and this one is the one it's meant to be. You know, this is, it was meant to be a coming of age novel that had a bit of a thriller aspect to it. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it wasn't meant to be an action adventure with buses exploding. It wasn't meant to be a horror gothic thing, which it was at one point with cage fighting. You know, like it was just... <laughs> There are lots of versions of this, you know, you know, you don't want to see them. They were just the worst ideas. I'm sure it's not as bad as what you're making out. I think everyone's their own worst critic, but I am, I'm really glad that it turned out to be what it is rather than the bus exploding <laughs> cage fighting previous <laughs> novel. 
it just look not yeah I just the more I think about those things the more ridiculous they sound and I think that's kind of like the thing I didn't have when I was doing those was like a, a sounding board, you know, like if I'd had an editor or an experienced author around me at the time and I'd been able to say the words out loud, like, so, you know, at the end, you know, the evil surgeon's going to make them cage fight for their life to get off the island. You know, like I, it's, someone would have been like, that sounds really stupid, you know, like, or, or someone, might, <laughs> you know, or even just hearing myself say it out loud, I might've gone, this is not, this is not going to be a book. This isn't going to get published. What am I thinking? Um, so there is a huge, um, there is a huge value in that mentorship process. Now I mentioned in your bio that Invisible Boys is being developed into a TV series. I know there are a lot of people waiting anxiously to see it. Where are things at? Um, it's going really well. Um, one of the uh, fun parts of doing uh, TV or film adaptation is that um, I can't say too much because I'm not allowed to. Uh, but the, the good news is it's progressing very, very well. Um, it's going to be a 10 episode series with uh, Stan is developing it at the moment, the streaming service, Stan Australia. Uh, we've had funding from Screen West and Screen Australia as well. Um, Nick Verso is directing. Um, he's a gay man himself. He's done um, Nowhere Boys, Boys in the Trees, um, Itch. He's doing crazy fun part for the ABC at the moment. Um, Tanya Chambers is producing like just really amazing people um, very very talented and I get to be in the writer's room which is really cool so um, I, you know I'm, I'm kind of in there and, and you know seeing how it unfolds and it's really amazing like it's I, I, I can't wait to actually be able to say <laughs> fundamentally more uh, than I used to um, uh, yeah I like I, I used to want to kind of say here's what we're doing with the show um, but now I'm just very cautious that, you know, I've got to just keep it to, um, keep it to vague levels of what's going on until I can, until I'm permitted to say more. So sorry if I sound so cagey at the moment when I, I talk the about vagueness. the TV show. Yeah, no, I, um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to, that's all right. So but, as but, but you're I will tell say, us sorry, though. I will add, mm -hmm. it sounds, it looks, it's going to be amazing. Like I can just, it's, it's an incredible thing that it's turning into. So as the author, if your work gets optioned for film, TV, series, whatever may happen, how much say do you get in things? Um, it really depends. Uh, so what, uh, what happened with us with this particular scenario is that we had multiple parties uh, interested in the rights. They were all really amazing people and I could have very happily kind of gone with uh, any of these parties. Um, but uh, because there was that sense of kind of finding the right fit and talking about what we wanted, um, me being involved in some of the writing process was kind of negotiated by my agent at the time. Um, that's not particularly common necessarily. Um, so uh, some writers will have no say at all. Um, and it really, it really varies. So um, I think I saw Craig Sylvie talking about this once in relation to Jasper Jones, and he was kind of saying like, you can, you can get, the situation where you kind of have full involvement like I think he might have written the screenplay for Jasper um, Jones the movie I'm not sure um someone might be able to correct me on that um but uh I think he had some like kind of direct involvement he was saying like there's that version there's the version where you kind of go you guys run with it that kind of keep me in the loop and then there's the version where you just don't know anything um which you know I don't know if that would be great either to just have no concept of what happens until you see it kind of on screens. Um, but it, it varies from kind of case to case and producer to producer and that kind of thing. But no say in casting. So we can't, you know, give us your, <laughs> give you our audition reel. Um, I'd be terrible. Uh, I'm not putting myself up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Well, um, well you're trying to. Um, no, I, that initially when the first kind of news broke that we had the rights optioned and then it was going into development, shortly after um like everyone I know who's an actor was like hey like just sliding into my dms and like wanting to have a little chat or um and I was like I have no say in this so so I'll say that very clearly like yeah I've got no say in casting but you production. do get a cameo I did I maybe <laughs> I it, yeah I, I kind of said like oh I'd love a little cameo of like you know like drunk bloke in the pub number two <laughs> Um, you know, angry FIFO worker number three, just something like completely unnamed and just like getting to yell out something in the background. I would just love that. Do we have a rough release date yet or is it still hush-hush? I can't say anything at this stage, but, you know, 
when there is more news, I'll be the one breaking it. Um, well, I hope I will be. I don't know, but but I will let people know as soon as uh, as soon as I can say anything. Now we do have a question from. I'm going to start going through questions, and while we're on this topic, there's a group at Vindoon Library watching, which is absolutely awesome to know that we're being streamed Hi. there. They want to know about the TV series and what your reaction was when you found out about it. Um. So about the TV series and what my reaction was. Yeah, when you, I'm guessing when you got told that Invisible Boys was becoming a TV series. Um. I was stoked because I didn't ever expect that to happen. Um, I, I didn't even expect to get published. And even though we announced it a little later, like the first conversations kind of started happening like within, I don't know, a few months of the book coming out, which I didn't expect, you know? So I was just absolutely stunned. And I started imagining like, oh, wow, like one day I'll turn my TV on and there'll be all these actual actors playing, you know, Zeke, Charlie, Hammer, Matt, like there'll be real people on the screen. Um, uh, but, it, but also like development is such a very long process um, that, you know, most authors will tell you that the best thing you can do um, is just like imagine that, you know, it's only happening once it's actually like happened, you know, because uh, a, a lot of things will get optioned and then don't get de in development. Things might get in development, not get any production. Might get into production and then, you know, doesn't get made or I don't know. Um, TV stops being a medium that anyone watches and I, like, who knows, there's all kinds of things that happen. Um, so one of the things they kind of tell authors is like, get your hopes up, you know, like a little bit, but just, just wait until you kind of see it. So um, I'm kind of, I'm super excited. And then I'm also constantly holding my breath and going like, oh, I, I can't wait till it happens. I hope it happens. I can imagine, I imagine it'd be quite, quite nerve wracking, just, just waiting to find out. Um, was it something you ever dreamed dreamed of earlier? Like when you were in those early fledgling writing stages, did you entertain the idea of getting a best-selling novel and it becoming a TV series? Oh, I mean, I think everyone kind of dreams of maybe that. But I, to be honest, I, I had those kind of thoughts more for um, like the fantasy adventure series that I was writing um, before Invisible Boys, which didn't get published. So it's not even out there. Um, but when I was writing that, I could really see that as a movie, you know, like, and kind of when I read Matthew Riley books, you know, you can kind of see them unfolding. They're written like movie scripts. So I remember seeing a lot of that. And, and when I was writing my own adventure stuff, I was thinking this would so work as a TV show. This would so work as a movie, um, which is completely putting the horse before the cart because or the cart before the horse, sorry, um, because, you know, it didn't even get published. So um, no, so I didn't really think Invisible Boys would ever necessarily make do it but I'm really glad it did do you ever see yourself going back to that fantasy novel um maybe I I have a very it's in my drawer it's like about a foot from where I'm sitting um printed out as this bound manuscript that I did at office works um I maybe I, I think about it every now and then and I think well I think it needs a heart transplant like I think it needs it needs soul and it needs heart in that story and that's the reason it didn't work and that's and, you know, heart is the reason that Invisible Boys in the Brink did work. Um, so if I went back to it, it would be kind of probably stripping out plot and stripping mm -hmm. out um, stuff that I thought was exciting that maybe isn't and put in a little bit of, like, characters who are, are real real people with, with heart. Um, but, you know, would it be YA? Maybe it would be adult. I'm not sure. PLWA asks, reading to fill time. I'm guessing what are you reading at the moment maybe to fill time? What am I reading at the moment? I think, yeah, I think that's where you're going, PLWA. If not, please correct me. Um, okay, yes, well, I'll, I'm, right now I'm reading uh, Miranda Luby's book, Sadie Starr's Guide to Starting Over, um, which is a new YA book, just came out through text publishing about... Well, same time as my book actually it came out start of August, um, and Miranda and I met at Varuna, the National Writers House, about four or five years ago. So it's pretty cool to get her book, and it's a really great YA book. Um, I'm about forty pages in, um, but it's about uh, you know perfectionism and trying to start over again at high school. A little bit of reinvention themes, kind of like the brink. Um, so that's what I'm reading. But also just before that, before I started touring, I, I was like, I need to read more classics, and I like haven't read so many. Um, so I started reading The Great Gatsby, 
because I've never read. Oh, um, I've you never read study it. Study it at school. I, see, well, see, I dodged that. I think we studied Cloud Street by Tim Winton at school, oh. and uh, I didn't do The Great Gatsby. I've never read it, and I just kind of thought, I I feel like you know a lot of my my uh, my writing chops or my literature chops are not kind of up to scratch. So I'm just trying to. Yeah, I think it'll be my focus for like maybe this summer will be, you know, once I'm done touring. Um, I mean, I have a, a billion books that I need to read by people who I've actually bought books from. Um, like any reader, you know, my TBR file is massive. Yeah. Like, let me just add some more books. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of like, I should go back and really read some good like 20th century literature and just immerse myself in a little bit of that for a while. I wouldn't mind. Fair enough. So PLWA has also asked, what do you think about non-LGBTQIA people writing or acting those characters? Oh, um, I have no problem with that. Um, I very much am of the mind that, you know, that's that's what fiction is. Fiction is for imagination. So, um, you know, I'm very okay with people writing outside their own experience. You know, typically they'll be acting with some form of empathy and they'll be doing some research to make sure things are authentic um so I think if that's done you know you'll be more or less okay um having said that I mean I, I think I only have an issue with it when it's kind of held up as being like an example of that thing so like there's mm -hmm. lots of um there's lots of male male romance for example written by straight female authors for a straight female audience um which is fine again I have no problem with that being um written um, but sometimes it'll be then held up as like, here is some example of, you know, gay literature and what this voice is all about and what these people are like. And it's like, well, no, that's, it's like holding up a Disney movie and saying, this is what, you know, this is what women want. Or, you know, like we wouldn't hold up a Disney film and say to young teenage girls right now, kind of, this is what you should aspire to for romance. You know, it's a great story, um, but it's not necessarily um, authentic and it's not necessarily coming from a, a place of, you know, being written by someone from that background. Um, so I kind of think the same when we see things like Heartstopper, which I find really charming. I really I haven't read the graphic novels, but I enjoyed the TV adaptation of it. Um, and I think that's really nice. Um, it's not authentic, you know, teenage boys getting together for the first time and not just hanging around making little snow angels. Um, I can tell you that right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I still think it's nice. So, like, I'm fine with people doing it. Um, and I, I certainly... I don't think there's any need to shut it down. I think there's a trend, you know, kind of societally, we're kind of in this era where, where people will get shut down or cancelled um, for doing something like that. You know, I don't think, I, I don't have any impulse to attack someone who writes a gay character when they're straight. Um, I, I just think the proof is in the pudding. You know, if they, if they write a good book, then cool. If they wrote bad representation that people didn't like, then, you know, I can give them a bad rating on Goodreads. If I'm really angry, I can write a blog post. There's a whole bunch of things I can do as a reader. Uh, to express that I didn't like something that an author did. Um, but it's not my job to ban their book. It's not my book job to cancel them. That's what fascists do. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of that in America right now with book bannings and things like that. Um, and I just don't think anyone should be engaged in anything like that. I think we can we can comfortably sit with bad representation and go, ugh, didn't like that. Let me read something else. Are you currently or willing to mentor emerging writers? Um, I am currently mentoring a few, maybe two, two authors, three, I think I've mentored three authors this year, um, but a couple of them have been shorter term mentorships and uh, one was just a consultation in fact, so it was like a one-off um, that I did for charity, I just kind of offered it up. Um, and then one, which is an ongoing mentorship um, at the moment. Um, so I do really love mentoring. Um, I have thought about, you know, moving into that space more robustly and actually offering, you know, say half a dozen mentorships for, you know, over the course of a couple of years. Um, and I do love doing that, um, but just life has been incredibly busy for me. So um, between touring and writing the next book and working on the TV show and, and everything, um, it's, it's very hard and, and what and what you want as a mentee is you want a mentor who can actually give you time um so I'm I'm not currently taking on mentees uh up until I know I can give them like my attention and actually give them the time that they need because the last thing you want as a mentee is um 
you know, you've written a book and you can't wait to get feedback on a men- from a mentor and then the mentor turns around and says, you know, oh, I'll be with you in six months. I mean, mm. that, that's incredibly frustrating when you want to do your next draft and you want to start querying agents, you know. Um, so I love it and I love working with emerging writers um, and I'll probably keep doing it. Um, currently not taking on mentees, but at some point I suspect I will probably open up at some point in my career and say, look, I'd love to take on a half a dozen or something like that. This is from Christina, who I think is at Bindoon Library. Where do you think you'll go with your third novel? Will you stick with Coming of Age or will you do another thriller? Um, well, this is a really great question. I've just written my third book um, and it's actually, it's actually for adults. Um, so the character is, at least in this version currently, he's 29 years old. So it's dealing with, it's dealing with hitting your 30s. Um, and, you know, the character is, um, a, you know, Italian, Australian, gym junkie with uh, anger Sounds issues. Sounds familiar. And, yeah, I can't tell you who he's, can't tell you who he's based off. Um, he likes Collingwood too. No, he doesn't. I didn't go that far. Um, but uh, it's, it's about being an adult and it's about a whole kind of, a whole heap of things. It's about family. It's about loneliness. Um, I don't think it's a thriller, but I, I can see myself writing a thriller in the future or, uh, like the brink, but maybe with an adult character again. Um, you know, when I think about that fantasy novel that I talked about that's not published, I sometimes think about, you know, is that a thriller? You know, do I take out the fantasy elements and does that become uh, a straight up thriller? You know, maybe that's what it's needing. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I will ever write a thriller again or not, but uh, definitely the third book is for adults and it's going to be kind of contemporary fiction Um similar to the Brink and Invisible Boys, really. Um, it, it's going to be facing the same kind of emotional stuff, but um, from a bit more of a mature perspective and as an adult. Beautiful. This is from Liz Flanagan, who is an English teacher and creative writing champion. Do you have any particular pathways you would encourage secondary students to follow if they're keen to be a writer? Um, yes. And that there's no one answer, though. Um, but yes. Basically, if you are young or old, but if you're um, looking at secondary students and and someone is looking to be a writer at that age, the main thing is that you get your time, your hours done, your 10,000 hours to become an expert. Um, You have to get those hours done somehow. So the same way you become a good footy player, you have to put in the time and do training and go to training and play games and do that all the time. Um, so my advice is always just the same. You have to do some form of training as a writer. It doesn't have to be a degree. It doesn't have to be a formal qualification or a course. Um, but some form of training is vital and it has to be a lot. You have to do tons of training to get really good at it. Um, so for me personally, I went to university. I did a creative writing uh, degree at Edith Cowan University. Um, it was a double major, actually. It was writing in French, um, which was very uh, artsy of me. Um, but I enjoyed every moment of both of those majors. Um, so that worked really well for me. Like I learned a lot in that degree. Um, there are other writers I know who never did a degree or you know, did a degree in something completely different. Um, but then they read a lot. They went to workshops. They had a mentorship. Um, they got manuscript appraisals from different people. Um, it doesn't really matter how you get it. So on my website, holdenshepherd.com forward slash FAQ, there's a bunch of frequently asked questions and there's a section of around advice around courses, mentorships, the kind of training you need to do. Um, and so, I'd, yeah, if anyone's interested in that, I'd recommend checking that out because there's a whole heap of information there. Um, but yeah, like for me, a degree really helped me learn my craft. Um, but then beyond that, you know, learning things like social media, um, learning things like the publishing industry, how to get an agent, how to write query letters, all of that stuff I did online by doing my own research and just spending hours and hours of trying to find this information, reading other books, um, guidebooks to the industry, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, training is a must. Research is a must. You often hear the catch cry from people who say, you know, I want to write a book, but I'm just too busy. I'll do it when X, Y, Z. When do you get the words done? How do you carve out the time? Mm, you know this is really important I was saying this to one of the mentees actually I was speaking to just the other day um because he had mentioned like you know he's working full-time so like you know 
where do you find the time? And I was like, this is, this is the thing. You don't find the time. You actually have to make it. And that means for me, and what I did and do, um, and I still do it to this day, um, but I also tell writers to do this, is to, um, like, it has to be booked into your calendar. Like, your writing time has to actually be booked into, you know, my, my daily calendar on my email is, you know, if I have writing time in there, I have to write. You know, and it's from 9 a.m. till whatever time, 3 p.m. to so. say. Um, and I have to be writing in that time. And there's, you know, it's it's like butt in the chair time to get that book done. Um, it has to be done. And especially when you are starting out and you don't have an advance that you have to pay back, you don't have a deadline with a publisher, you've only got your own motivation to go on. Um, so it's really vital to start treating it like it's a job. And it's like you have to, you know, you must attend, you must rock up at the job the same way you would at your day job when you're required to be there from nine to five. You know, if, if you're working nine to five, Monday to Friday and trying to write a novel, then, you know, which I was, you know, years ago, um, then it was like, okay, the weekend from 9am to 5pm, I'm sitting at my computer on a Saturday and a Sunday and I'm writing my fantasy novel and I'm doing my best because that's the only time. And if people want to see me during that time, I have to say no, which Mm. sucked. Um, but there were like there had to be sacrifice in order to get it done. Um, so yeah, it's it's a hard thing. It's so true. I think the best thing anyone ever said to me once when I was back in the old habit of oh, I want to write a book, but I'm too busy, I can't do it. An uh, old colleague of mine said, and he said he was being harsh, but it was what I needed to hear. He was like, No, Shanae, you're not too busy. It's obviously not a priority. Because if it's a priority, you make time, like you find it because how much time do we waste on social media on with Netflix and, and all of these things. And it was exactly the kick up the bum that mm. I needed. Yeah. And it does, you're right though. It does sound mean. Like when I said it to this mentee, like yeah. Yeah, I could just kind of see him going like, like, like his face was kind of like, but I'm already working nine to five. And I was like, I know. Like, you I either know. want it or you don't. Like, and it was kind of like that. It was like, you know, and that's how I felt at the time. Like I remember people coming to my house and just rocking up because I had the kind of family that sometimes would do that. Mm-hmm. Um, especially coming from a country town, you know, people just sometimes rock up. Um, but you know, people would rock up at my doorstep and be like, oh, "Hi, like we we've just arrived and we're here for a coffee." And I was like, "I like, I'm so sorry, but if I don't get this done today, it doesn't." Like I, I just remember being mm-hmm. like, "This is my day. I have to write, and this is all I have. And if I don't do this, I won't make it." Yeah. Um, and so having a quick chat at the door and then saying, you know, <laughs> "Phone me next time," um, but but it had to be done. Um, so some of that sacrifice just has to happen, um, but it's well worth it. I don't think yeah. I've ever met a writer who's done that kind of stuff, who's sacrificed their, their spare time, who's worked, you know, um, absolutely kind of done the grind at the day job and the personal life and then also just switch modes and done the grind at the writing. I don't think I've ever met anyone who has regretted any moment of that. You know, like everyone has just, because you're pursuing something you love and you, you can barely notice the hours go by once you're in that kind of state of mind, you know. I'm going to give a quick shout out. We've got Rockingham Library watching as well, which is really cool that they've organised something to have people watching. If anyone's got a question from Rockingham, please pop it in. From Bindoon Library, we have Annie who's asking, how difficult did you find the publishing journey here in WA? Is your agent local or someone over east and did you struggle getting your novels noticed? Oh, okay. Three questions in one. Um, happy all to in. They all, all together. Really. They all together. Yeah, all together. But I'll, um, uh, so I have an agent, Gabby Nayer, from Left Bank Literary, which is over in Sydney, um, which is where she's based. Um, had a drink with her when I was there, which was lovely. Um, but mostly it's, you know, over the phone and Zoom and email. Um, so having an agent in Australia, by the way, is not kind of as vital as in the UK and in the US, like in the, in those markets, uh, they're so enormous and saturated that uh, an agent is often required to get a publishing contract. But in Australia, you can land a contract without having an agent. Um, that said, uh, in my view, an agent is worth their weight in gold. Um, they can negotiate a better contract, a better deal for you. Um, so I've been very lucky that I've had agents had an, uh, a first agent before Gabby um, and now have Gabby who helped me negotiate um, the deal with text publishing who published The Brink and then my third novel as well. 
Um, having someone to do that and kind of walk you through any concerns you have is amazing. Because sometimes you'll see something in a publishing contract and you'll be like, what does this mean? You're like, is this normal even? You know, like, are these percentages right? Are these numbers right? Um, you, you don't have a clue as an author. You just, you know, I don't know. I just work here. You know, like, I don't, I don't know anything about the industry. Um, so having an agent kind of come in and say, yep, this is industry standard. You know, this is really good. This is, this is amazing. Um, you know, this part's not so good. Let's see if we can change that. Um, that was really valuable to have. Um, so, yeah, so having an agent to me was like what made it kind of easy enough to, to go through and break into the industry because um, I wasn't totally on my own. Um, but, you know, being on your own is quite doable. I mean, mo most publishers, most known renowned publishers in Australia are pretty kind of mostly good operators anyway. There's very few kind of dodgy ones. The dodgy ones are usually the ones that say, give us $10,000 and we'll publish your book for you. Um, not normal. <laughs> not normal. And, you know, <laughs> the money must always flow to the author that's the rule um but yeah did that answer all three prongs of that um, question i feel like and I did you struggle one. to get your novels noticed originally oh, by either yes. an agent or a publisher i guess yes um yes hugely um so the fantasy novel no one wanted um no agents took it up one agent wanted a full request so he read the whole manuscript um but ultimately declined and said you know your writing's good but it's not for me um invisible boys was picked up when it won the ray copy residency award in 2017 so my first agent picked that up um and repped it um but every publisher rejected it actually so all the when i say every publisher all the big five rejected it initially and kind of said things like we love the writing but we don't know how to market this guy um and this Oof, are they like kicking themselves now <laughs> I mean, I kind of like a little bit of me is kind of like, I hope so. <laughs> like, um, because, you know, and I'm very grateful to Fremantle Press for taking me up because they they saw the value of this story and they didn't try to, they didn't try to like, sh like sand off any of the rough edges of what I'm doing. You know, like they, they were happy to lean to the swearing and the sex and all the, everything else. Whereas some of the big five publishers, uh, you know, from, from why authors that I've heard from on their lists will be like, you know, having, you know, 17 year olds having a drink at a party and they'll be like, you can't have teenage drinking and you know, you know, young adult books, that's not okay. Um, and to me, that's wild. That, that's so sanitized. So I understand why my book didn't get picked up by those publishers in hindsight. Um, but yeah, initially it was very hard. Um, the Brink even, you know, didn't initially uh, get picked up uh, the very first time it was subbed. Um, so it was subbed as an earlier version um, in like early 2020. Um, and, and initially publishers, and this is after Invisible Boys had come out and was kind of doing quite well and had won awards. Um, and it, it initially didn't get uh, a lot of interest, which I found horrifying. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier. Like you can, you know, people can be on their fourth or fifth book and they can send out a manuscript to a publisher and publishers can be like, no, nah, no. Nah not really interested, um, which I just didn't know. Like when I was an emerging author, I just kind of thought, okay, once you get one out there, it's done, you know, done and dusted. You're out there now, you're a published author. So it's a guarantee. Um, and that's not how the industry works at all. It's like it's one big uphill slog forever and ever. Um, but, uh, you know, eventually you know, some rewrites, I got a new agent um, and we've got a wonderful deal. So um, it does, it, it, perseverance really pays off in this industry. And I actually think often, um, I'm not going to say that matters most because the thing that matters most is being able to write. Mm -hmm. But perseverance is probably the quality. When I can see it in the writer that I'm mentoring, for example, I'm like, that one's going to make it. I can tell because there's just this doggedness of like, I'm not giving up no matter how many times I get knocked back. And that's kind of what it takes. Like I know lots of very good writers who um, didn't have the ability to persevere um, and they're not published. They're very, very talented writers. Um, but they didn't have that kind of fire in the belly. Um, and this industry um, requires that element, that, that courage and that perseverance to kind of go, okay, that everyone in the world has knocked back my novel. I'm going to start again with a whole new novel and do the whole thing again. And you just do that as many times as it takes until you break through. Like that's, that's a huge thing, but it's, it's what it takes. I love your honesty and for sharing that because I think as much as it's lovely to hear about the success stories, 
and the awards and all of that side of things, it's all equally important, if not more, to hear about the knockbacks just to to instill, I guess, that, you know, keep going. It's happened to everybody and look at what the potential outcome is, but you need to push through it and have that, that perseverance. I'm going to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today. Thank you to Public Libraries 